There we go. Well, good morning, everybody. My name is Sandy Beach. I'm an alcoholic. And I've never seen 2,000 people at a traditions workshop. This is, um, that's really amazing. Um, Bob did a wonderful job of setting up um, the whole picture of our traditions. And like Bob, I didn't have any interest in them when I was new. But as um, the years went by, I found I became very interested in AA history. Because I got curious, how did this all happen that I got saved? And my interest in AA history changed my mind about history. I was one of these guys growing up, and they'd go, hey, do you want to take a history course? And I'd go, why should I do that? It already happened. (laughs) Well, why would you be interested in that? I saw no value in history. And now all I read about is history. Uh, it, it It is so essential to put the third dimension in everything, to really see um, what it's all about. I mean, it's the most fascinating thing in the world, and probably the first 40 years, 45 years of my life, I thought it was a joke. So you can see how our own perspective gets changed in a process uh, of spiritual growth. And it's that change in perspective that makes everything wonderful. As a matter of fact, that's why we drank. It wasn't to change the world. It was to change how we saw it. And you walk into a bar and live in the damnedest world. They're all awful. About three drinks later, you go, now that's more like it. (laughs) That Now things are looking good. It all was a personal transformation inside. And I'm sure these traditions caused the transformation in Alcoholics Anonymous. And we ended up with a very amazing worldwide, been through all kinds of problems, and came out stronger than ever. And that didn't happen by accident, because we people get in arguments all the time with one another. But there's something magic about the traditions, even if they don't seem magic when you read them. And there's something magic about the steps, even though when you read them, you don't see any magic there. What is that? I remember looking at those steps, and my sponsor said, everything you need is right in here. I'm going, well, I've read them for a week. Where is the money step? (laughs) I don't see it. So I couldn't see the value of the steps until I did them. And we really don't see the traditions until you've been around a while, and then you see them in action, and then they become quite miraculous. So it's hard to express them in a lecture, if you follow what I mean, to capture the power that they have and the importance they have in our own lives. And I think it's... The longer we're sober, the more we realize how precious sobriety is and how valuable because of all the changes that it made in our lives. And we go, wow, this is really a bigger deal than I thought. I thought I was just going to get sober. I didn't know I was going to be transformed, that I was going to actually see the whole purpose of life. I didn't know that was going to happen. I thought I was just going to stop drinking. And you just go, oh, my God, this is a much bigger deal than I thought. And so the traditions are. They really are. They're a bigger deal than they might appear as we try to present them. And um, actually, I'm just going to start with seven and, um, and, and wrap it up. Every AA group ought to be fully self-supporting, declining outside contributions. Now, this was written by people who were broke. Okay, is that a miracle? <laughs> hey, we got some money. Somebody wants to leave us $10,000 in their will. What do you think we ought to do? What do you think they ought to do? We're broke. We can barely get the word out. Well, let's see. Okay. 
Every AA group ought to be fully self-supporting, declining outside contributions. Why shouldn't we take the money? Money has a lot of strings attached to it. Let's say, for example, that you are looking for a place to hold an AA meeting. Your group is just bursting at the seam, so you need another location. You can't fit in the room anymore. So you get a little committee, and somebody says, you know, I think our church would love us. Let me go talk to the minister. Talk to the minister, and the minister said, oh, my God, he himself had been praying for an AA group to come to his church because there's a lot of alcoholics in his congregation. And out of the joy of this group requesting it, he goes, you can have it. What night would you like it? We will make our doors available for you, free of charge. We will even supply the coffee. That's how much we love the idea of you coming. That's pretty enticing, isn't it? Wow, I don't even have to pay rent. They love us here. Wonderful. And we might actually start out that way. And then you've been there about three years and Every anniversary, the minister talks at your, to say how happy you are at our group. And then he comes to the group one night and he said, listen, our membership's falling off in the church itself. Mind if I make a little pitch during your meeting to maybe see if some of you AA members would like to join the church itself? After all, you are here every week. Now, you haven't paid any rent, and you're getting free coffee. It's harder to say no, isn't it? It's a lot harder to say no. But if you've paid no minutes when we first started, we go, no, sir. We're going to come up with a rent amount. Whatever we come up with, it, it isn't the amount. It's the fact that we are insisting on it. $50 a month, whatever it is. And then we pay it every month. We have a check written out to the church. And we decline the coffee offer. We might not even use their coffee pots. We go buy our own coffee pots. It is to symbolize this. We are responsible for ourselves. We want to take responsibility. And it went all the way up to um, AA and people in their wills leaving large amounts of money and the idea of turning it down, that it will cause us to lose our perspective. It'll change the way we see things. You want to see a problem. Um, have an AA group collect a lot more money than it needs and not send it anywhere. And all of a sudden the group has, let's pick the number, $2,000 in it. And then the, the word gets out, you know, we got $2,000 in our group. Well, let's sit down and figure out what we ought to do with that. <laughs> Wouldn't that be tempting? What do you think we ought to do with that? Well, you know, it's too hot in here. We ought to get an air conditioner. That's what we ought to do with it. No, I think we ought to send it up to New York. Up to New York? That isn't going to help me. I'm hot. <laughs> Why would we send it up to New York? Well, I think we ought to get uh, decaf coffee. We haven't had any. And, you know, maybe we could hire somebody to make the coffee, and then I won't have to come in here. All <laughs> Screw you. You ain't getting air conditioned. I'm not coming back. All over what? Money. All over money. Every, I could see us here right now. We're taking sides. What do you mean, don't send it to New York? Somebody over here going, I hate being hot. New York's got plenty of money. They're getting the book revenue now. Screw them. <laughs> Do you see what happens? Do you see? it's So these were written by people with character defects who didn't want the character defects to win. That's what this is all about. <laughs> it's to prevent us from ruining our own heaven, as Bob was talking about, by being in charge, by being in charge. There's a great deal of humility in these traditions. 
There's a great lack of ego all the way throughout them, starting with the one that Bob talked about, with unity. That it, AA is more important than me. It, it starts right there. And as a matter of fact, everything else is really designed to preserve what he was talking about, the unity. And um, certainly this one is fully self-supporting, declining outside contributions. That's what gives the group its autonomy, which is a very important thing within Alcoholics Anonymous, where nobody can come to a group and say, wait a minute, you can't have 12 speakers during an AA meeting. Well, that's the name of our group, the 12 speaker group. What do you mean you can't have 12 speakers? <laughs> they all talk five minutes and then we go home. <laughs> Nobody can come, some AA policeman, and go, you can't have a 12-speaker group. They just go, well, that's a stupid idea. I won't be going there. <laughs> but they are going to do it the way they want. And that's where the autonomy comes from, is we're managing our own affairs. Okay, Tradition 8, Alcoholics Anonymous should forever remain nonprofessional, but our service centers may employ special workers. Now, as Bob was uh, talking about in Tradition 6, we're not going to endorse anything um, outside of AA. The early plans for Alcoholics Anonymous, when you study the history, Bill, mostly Bill. You know, Bill was the idea man, and Bob was the put the blanket over the idea man before he... <laughs> <laughs> before he runs off and sells AA to Hollywood, you know. They say, oh, boy, I got some ideas because he was a Wall Street guy and a promoter, and, and so was Hank Parker, the, his co partner. And they, they promote, promote, promote. They didn't know anything about a program of attraction. It was promote. And his original plan, I mean, when he called those first 20 guys together, uh, and they said, you know, we've got something here. We, we, we should start spreading this. And his plan was very simple. We need paid missionaries. And we need a chain of drunk tanks or hospitals. AA paid missionaries and AA chain of hospitals. And we need a book. Those were the, those were the three things that were necessary in Bill's mind to get this thing off the road. And so you could see right off from the bat, it was going to be professional. We're going to paid missionary. And of course, nobody would give him money. It was, uh, it was God that was blocking Bill's plan. It wasn't Bill changing his mind. He'd go there. I got this great plan. You know, hey, hey, we're going to sober up the world. How about donate some money? No, I think I'll give it to the Boy Scouts. No, no, no. And everywhere he went, he was blocked from getting any money, so we had to spread the word on our own in a non-professional way, and it worked. Slowly, but it worked. And it established something that may not have been visible from the start, that an alcoholic will listen to a non-professional more than they would to a professional. So when you go through treatment and the counselor is giving a lecture, there's a whole different energy than when you get a sponsor. And the sponsor is there because he loves you and isn't getting paid. And you go, why would he spend all this time with me? And we get come all the way back to the entire point of Alcoholic Anonymous, which is one drunk talking to another, which is what Bob said right in the very beginning. Everything else in Alcoholics Anonymous is designed to ensure and support one drunk talking to another. Nothing replaces that. Everything else just helps that. It helps that to happen. It creates phones and intergroups so that the alcoholic is put in touch with the person who's going to talk to him, the one-on-one. -on -one. That's what everything else is for. 
That's why we have conferences where we talk about traditions. We're going to keep this entire system working, but the system gets no one sober. The only sobriety happens one drunk talking to another. I don't care what we'd like to think. Oh, yeah, we had this great big convention. 2,000 people came there, and 57 of them were saved. No. 57 of them might have said, well, maybe I'll talk to somebody. And then it happened. And so you can see how important the non-professional. Now, having established that, there then came the controversy when treatment centers and outside people were trying to help with the disease of alcoholism, and they saw that some of the people who could be hired as an employee happened to be members of AA. What better person to train to be an alcohol counselor at a treatment center than a alcoholic? It would be a very wonderful thing. They could go back and do some studying, and then they could be do whatever the treatment center wanted them to do, but they're not doing 12-step work. And if we want to have an inner group where the phones are manned all day long and people come in, buy literature, they'll type up the list of meetings, they'll do all kinds of things, organize a convention, whatever, it's only normal to have paid employees there who's going to work for nothing. They're not going to sit in that office all month for no pay. Well, who would be a good person to do that? Maybe a member of AA. So while that member of AA is in the office answering the phones, arranging for one alcoholic to talk to another, they are not doing 12-step work. So it's perfectly okay for them to be paid. But in the beginning, you used to hear this in the 60s, especially when the treatment centers really started taking off. Oh, you know, look at there's Ralph. He's getting paid for 12-step work. Look at that, Ralph, Ralph, Ralph. You know, uh, obviously... We had run out of stuff to gossip about. <laughs> nobody was getting divorced or nobody was having an affair. And, you know, so, hey, Ralph, did you hear me? You know, you just run out of gossip. you got to find some. So there it was. And Bill put all this to rest in this tradition and carefully in the central office in New York. It's manned by alcoholics and non-alcoholics. But those are jobs. They are not 12-step work. So that clearly was established in uh, Tradition 8. Okay, Tradition 9. Uh, AA, as such, ought never be organized, but we may create service boards or committees directly responsible to those they serve. And um, sometimes when I'm talking about the traditions... I like to start out by saying AA is so big now. I mean, it's in 130 countries and, I don't know, 200,000 groups and 4 million miracles. And, um, I mean, now you don't hardly have a TV show that doesn't have a subplot with somebody going to an AA meeting. You know what I mean? It's just, it's just everywhere, so everybody really knows about it. And so if you were a sociology student, you might suddenly go, they ought to have a college course on AA. What is this social phenomenon? What is it? What is this? So you're a student and you come and you go, could someone please explain this phenomenon of Alcoholics Anonymous? So who's in charge, please? God, like Bob said. Well, but, but, but. Um, well, how, how do you determine your members? How, 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 how does that set up? Because I hear there's a lot of members. Oh, the members decide. If they decide they're a member, they are. Oh, you're not involved in the process? You AA? No, no, no. They decide that they're a member. We don't have anything to say about it. Oh, really? That sounds backwards. I, that's, that's just quite amazing. Well, who's in charge? Well, we already covered that. <laughs> well, um, how do we donate to it? How do you get your money? Oh, we pass the basket. That's it? You just pass the basket? How do you run a budget? How do you know anybody's going to put anything? We don't. 
<laughs> haven't got a clue. Well, what are the treasures? How do you sit down? How do you know you're going to have the rent money? Faith. <laughs> what, uh, uh, but that's not, nobody else is organized like that. Are you sure this can work? All right, well, how is it organized? That, that's what I'd like to know. There must be an incredible organization for something that loose to function. Oh, yes, let me read. AA as such ought never be organized. That's our basic, <laughs> that's our basic guideline for organization. At this time, the kid is going back to the school and I don't think we want to do a course on <laughs> Alcoholics Anonymous because it's not true. It doesn't exist and they don't have all those things in it. It's just a rumor that there's, it's in 125 countries because it couldn't be based on the principles that, that they use. No one is in charge of anybody. There is no one in the eight, like Bob said, they've voted somebody out. Clarence got voted out. I've written a book on Clarence Snyder. He was, he was such a dynamo and controversial and everything and, um, breaking his anonymity. And so the members of his home group held a meeting without him there, voted him out. <laughs> said, you're, you're no longer a member of this group. And he said, okay, but I'm still coming. <laughs> The only requirement is a desire. I still have the desire, and I'm going to sit right here as a non-member. Well, then they realized what a joke it was, that you can't do that. There's no one that could enforce this. There's no one in charge. There's no one that can tell anyone else in AA what to do. A delegate can't come to a group and go, as the delegate from this area. You can't run a group like this. They go, well, watch this. <clears throat> We'd run it that way. <laughs> what AA can do, as they do in the tradition Bob was talking about, they could send a letter and they could say, it's come to our attention that your policies in this group are such and such, like a group in Richmond that was serving beer. <laughs> now, the other groups were going nuts. Well, you got to realize back then... When you drank, you drank whiskey and you got beer free. Your daughter shot a whiskey and they go, what do you want? Wine, beer, or ginger ale or some soft drink. Chaser. So it was seen as just a chaser. So these guys just starting the group. Well, we'll just have beer. <laughs> and of course, they wanted to stop it. All the other groups. Can you believe it? They're going to some beer over there. <laughs> Well, no one could stop it. However, it did stop itself. No one could remember what night of the week the meeting was. And it fell by the wayside of its own weight as being a bad idea. Now, the, uh, the letter that came would be suggesting it was a bad idea, and it probably isn't going to work. But if you didn't want to read the letter from General Service Office advising you to the contrary... And the letter would simply say, it's our experience. In other words, we've heard of a group in Holland that tried that. We heard of one in South Africa, and it didn't work there. We just thought we'd pass it on to you. So you can see there's no one in charge, no one in authority in AA at all. And yet AA works. It's got to be organized somehow. Yes, there are jobs that have to be done. There are committees to put on this conference. And volunteers go, I'd like to be on that. No one can force you to be on it. Not like at work where they go, okay, you three are on this committee and you three are on that committee. It's voluntary. So as we get all these volunteers, then we might elect among ourselves somebody to be in charge of our decorations committee to hold the meeting so that we can decide what kind of decorations we want. And this is what where the only organizational part of Alcoholics Anonymous is, is, is in the volunteer, in the servant area, so that we can get um, things done that will enhance one alcoholic talking to another. That's what it all comes back to. We need the 
more pamphlets. Somebody said this might help. Somebody with a handicap. We'll write about handicapped alcoholics, and that'll help someone with a handicap or a gay person or a black person or an American Indian. I mean, they, they, they tried to come up with all the differences that we have. Old people. Now they're writing one on old people. I feel like writing in. We don't need any help. I know I'm old. <laughs> what are you writing a pamphlet on old people for? <laughs> Uh, there's probably somebody being helped in spite of my judgment that we don't need it. You follow what I'm saying? And so the only organizational structure is in service, which ties in with the entire thrust of spirituality and humility. How should we organize the servants in order to get the service work done? You know, in New York, I don't know if they still do it, but when I took my first tour of the office up there, there are, I forget how Bob may be able to correct me, there's like seven key uh, positions, uh, literature, loaners, conventions, um, organizing the general service conference. So there's these staff people that have these key positions. Every year, they move over one office. Now I'm in charge of loaners, just to make sure you aren't the expert at, you follow what I'm saying, which would have, I've been 10 years in this, and now I am. I'm just a servant like everybody else, and next year I'll be serving over there. It's almost rotating, like we do rotating. I hate it when they tell me I can't make coffee anymore. I love having the key open the room, and make the coffee. I don't know why, but I, that's my favorite job. And I got it now. I have a Monday night where I'm doing that, but I know it's been almost a year, and they're going to be coming. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I do, and I shouldn't admit to this, but maybe somebody takes it over, and after a couple months, they go, I hate coming here early. I said, I'll take it over for you. <laughs> then I get another year. <laughs> I don't think that's in the traditions, but um, they haven't caught me yet. <laughs> okay, where was I? Ten. Alcoholics Anonymous has no opinion on outside issues, hence the AA name not never be drawn into public controversy. Um, Bob was talking about this, but I wanted to go into it in a little more detail. Because the story really dramatizes this tradition. And uh, the story really begins many, many years ago when six guys were drinking in a bar. If you haven't heard this story, it's a good one. And these guys were um, middle-aged. They were very successful businessmen. Uh, they had families. They were happy. They had money. But they all knew that they were alcoholics and that they were going to lose it. They could feel their disease, and they used to kid each other. You know, Joe, you're going to lose your business and your wife. You, I mean, my wife told me that she's your wife is thinking of leaving. Yeah, your wife told me that <laughs> my wife is thinking. You know, I mean, they just they saw the handwriting on the wall. And so one of them one day said, this was back when pledges were big. The temperance movement was running all around the country. And one of them said, I'm going to come up with a pledge. I'm going to write it myself. And then we'll all take it. And we'll see if the six of us in our pledge can stay sober. So he wrote up a pledge. We the undersigned do swear, solemnly swear in front of God and all our witnesses that I will never take another drink of intoxicating alcohol for the rest of my life. And then they all signed it. And they started staying sober. Just from the pledge. And then other guys, and so then they went out and they saw, they knew somebody else that was in trouble and they said, Fred, you ought to come join, sign our pledge. So the entire program was the pledge. And they made a big deal out of it. They would have a ceremony in town. Now we have ten pledge takers. Anybody else want to be on the pledge? And they, they would look for somebody like the mayor and get him to sign the pledge. 
and then lots of other people. And at the end of the first year in this city, in Baltimore, they had a parade with a band and they're and all the pledgers are walking down. And I don't know, I think they had something like 500, 500 of these guys just taking the pledge and staying sober. And the, the, the original guy was such an organizer. He says, all right, now you go up to New York and start to take this pledge up there and get a bunch of people. And you, you go over to Pennsylvania. And he sent different guys that had taken the pledge and they started this thing. And, um, they were looking for a name, and they said, well, we want something that will make it really important. And, of course, nothing could be more important at that time, you know, in the 1840s and 50s than George Washington. I mean, that was the name. So they said, we'll call ourselves the Washingtonian Society after George, and that will get us a lot more people in. And as Bob said, in a matter of a very few years, the numbers I saw was 400,000 people had taken the pledge and it was in city all over the place it had a bigger percentage of the population in their movement than AA does now in the United States we're nowhere near that percentage of the population that they had and when you have a amassed a large number of people Outside forces look and they go, that's a potential power base. You follow what I'm saying? The AA would be a very big power base. I mean, if I had a product and I wanted to sell it and I said AA endorsed it, there's a lot of AA members that might buy it. You follow what I'm saying? So wouldn't it be nice if I could get AA? So we had the endorsement thing that Bob was talking about, but this is more... Why would I be tempted to do that? Well, I believe in that, what they want me to endorse. I like the idea. And one of the issues was slavery. This was just start leading up to the Civil War. And not drinking, prohibition. We get those two things. What could be more God's will than wiping out this horrible thing called slavery and wiping out this terrible thing called alcohol that is killing and ruining the lives of all these people. Very tempting to get involved and to take an opinion on a noble cause. And as Bob said, within four years, they were gone. It divided. They just disappeared. Took them away from their primary purpose. Oh, primary purpose. Stay sober and straighten out South Africa. <laughs> you, you follow what I'm saying? Well, just pick something. Pick your favorite cause. Stay sober and... <clears throat> and goodbye. They were gone so much that when Bill was writing the traditions, someone said, well, Bill, you ought to look into the history of the Washingtonians. Maybe there's some lessons there for you. And he had never heard of them. That's how far they had disappeared. They're just gone. So if they ever went, it would be gone. You know, when you're gone, you're gone. You don't hardly see anybody running around with hula hoops. <laughs> I remember when everybody had one. But when they're gone, they're gone. It's just they're gone. And I don't want to see AA gone. And so that's what this is, an opinion, just an opinion. Now, in order to have opinion, you have to be willful. It's the only way to have an opinion. I'm right and they're wrong. You know how that goes? I'm right and they're wrong. An opinion, very unspiritual thing. Just the opposite of God's will. Who wants to give up your opinions not me. Well, then you can't let go and let God. You can't hold on to any of those and be guided by your higher power. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh, oh. Kind of hard, isn't it? In the 70s, when, um, oh, God, Hughes, Harold Hughes from Iowa was a, 
U.S. senator and a recovered alcoholic, and he's the man who decided that there ought to be a law passed making alcoholism a disease and allowing insurance companies to cover treatment of this disease in a hospital much like other diseases are covered. In other words, it's, it's to, to make it a disease and therefore eligible for medical help. It would legitimize it. It would make it so that you don't have to be ashamed. It would go, it would help in many, many ways. So he got the law passed and that was the first time that Congress got involved in an alcohol issue other than prohibition, an alcoholism issue. And they created the National Institute on Alcohol and Alcohol Abuse, which Marty Mann had actually started, and so all this happened out of that. Well, about eight years later, in the uh, Health and Human Services Committee of the U.S. Senate, somebody, one senator, I forget who it was, I was working as a lobbyist back then, they came up with, we ought to put warning labels on alcohol like we do on cigarettes. You know, because if it was there, I mean, I don't know how you feel about labels. I don't read them myself, but um, that was the, the bill. And they were having hearings on should we put warning labels. And one of the committee staff said, I'll tell you who is the perfect source to get an opinion on putting warning labels on bottles, and that's Alcoholics Anonymous. Let me call the central office in New York, General Services, and see if they could send somebody down. They said, yeah, we'll send somebody down to talk to you. So they sent a staff person down, and they got him in the committee staff room, and they said, listen, here's what we're going to do. What would AA think about this idea? And they looked at him and said, oh, we have no opinion whatsoever on that. <laughs> no. But it's alcohol. It's You guys all drank bottles, 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 bottles. I mean... Who would know more about that than you? And uh, they said, we have no opinion whatsoever on putting a label on a bottle. And went back to New York, and then they went back to the senators, and they said, they have no opinion whatsoever. I think the, the uh, originator of the bill was insulted. <laughs> he felt we were saying his bill wasn't important. But that was in the record, that AA had no opinion on this. That's not to say that individual AA members don't have opinions. We can have opinions all over the place, and I have an opinion on that issue, and I'm going to share it with you right now. I believe there should be warning labels on alcohol bottles, and I know what it should say so that it'll do some good. This is what the label should say. Warning. This bottle may run out. <laughs> <laughs> you should consider buying two. <laughs> and then we won't have alcoholics going home. They thought they had enough. They finished the bottle. It's midnight. They don't have enough. They get in their car. They're drunk. They're going back to get a second bottle. They get a DWI. If they had the second bottle, they wouldn't have done that. So we'd finally have a label that would do some good. So opinions, opinions. I mean, how wonderful to have an organization that has no opinions on anything except one drunk helping another. Again, eliminating controversy, keeping us focused, focused, focused on being a servant, focused on God, focused on the most important thing we could ever do in our lives. The last two traditions have to do with anonymity, and I'll wrap them up and then we'll be out of here in seven minutes. Public relations policy is based on attraction rather than promotion. We always need to maintain personal anonymity at the level of press, radio, and films. And when you read the tradition book or the AA history, anonymity and the, and the wonderful value that we have came about as a result of fear. There was this fear. It was the unknown. When you're getting sober and starting something like this to go help drunks who are not looked on too kindly by society. You want to keep it secret. You know what I'm saying? We don't, let's not brag. Let's not go all over. Somebody might shut us down. And then the other fear was, look, there's only five of us, and we know there's like nine million alcoholics in America. What if the word got out and nine million guys showed at our door? There wouldn't be enough of us 
to help them. So let's keep it a secret. We'll call ourselves Alcoholics Anonymous. No names. Nobody will be able to find us at home. You know, and get 60,000 calls a night. None of this was true, but when you have fears, you have big ones. And so that's what was going on in the beginning. And then, as it started to unfold, they realized the power of anonymity on two levels. One was on making it a a program of attraction rather than promotion. And Bob talked about the the, uh, Jack Alexander story where this guy came to investigate AA. He found out what it was, and he went out and told the good news to the world. It wasn't AA telling the good news. It was a skeptical reporter. I went there, and let me tell you what I found. So a program of attraction relies on others to tell our story. And and the Cleveland Plain Dealer, perhaps one of the greatest events to tell the AA story was the John Rockefeller, John D. Rockefeller, black tie dinner in 1941 in New York City where he invited all the elite, all the top bankers, the church people, the cream of the crop in New York City to come to a dinner honoring AA. A lot of people, a lot of, he got a lot of criticism. He must be off his rocker. Black tie dinner for drunks? What is that? And it was in all the papers. It was in all the papers. And what it did, it legitimized the disease of alcoholism, and Alcoholics Anonymous in one big story. And so our story is told by others. And it's so amazing. Think about this. I don't know if you've you've observed this, but I think in the last 20 years, there's an element in the press that delights in digging up dirt. Maybe I'm wrong, but it just seems that way. Well, if I was one of those reporters and I wanted to dig up dirt with no effort whatsoever, I would just park out in front of AA meetings and see, oh, there's the mayor's assistant. Bingo. I could have I could have enough stories to go on for. I'd never have to work. I'd just go down to the intergroup office, get the meeting list, pull up to the meetings, and watch. And I have all the stories I want. And they don't do it. How do you like that? They'll do it everywhere except AA. Isn't that amazing? They understand this tradition sometimes better than we do. Sometimes our own members want to go, and I'm also a member of AA. And the newspaper editor says, take out the sentence where he said he was a member of AA. Because we understand. When they had this tradition, they wrote to all the newspapers in the country, and they said, we want to maintain anonymity, at personal anonymity, at the level of press, radio, and films. And it is amazing what that desire for no publicity did in terms of getting publicity. Let me tell you about the people that don't want publicity. What a story that is. Here's people that don't want any attention. They just want to help drunks. How could you tell that story yourself and be believed? I'm holding this press conference to let you know that we're only interested in helping drunks. Uh, My name is Sandy Beach. You want me to stand this way? Okay, good. (laughs) You see the difference? It's a wonderful, powerful thing, this maintaining and the relationship between AA and the press that came about almost accidental. The last one, what they discovered out of here, anonymity is the spiritual foundation of our traditions, ever reminding us to place principles before personalities. They realized as they did this, the importance of not being anything. They realize that when you say, someone asks you, who are you? 
Now, if you're somebody who's successful here in San Francisco and someone outside of AA says, who are you? Tell them, Joe, you just sat down here with five other guys. We don't really know each other. Who are you? You would go, well, I went over here to the college in San Francisco. I studied this. I wrote these three books. I'm on the board of directors of the blah, 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 and the beep, and the bop, and I go to this church, and I give talks on this, and I also am, and I am also an expert engineer, and I've let, and that's who I am. You follow what I'm saying? Now, what is that? That's ego. That's who I am. You see what I'm saying? It's a big thing. Look about a resume. You're, going, you're looking for a job, so you write a resume. What do you put on a resume? Everything that will get you more. Hey, don't, don't forget, put those three courses you put down. It might be worth 5000 a year. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and we pump that thing up, and we pump it up, and we pump it up, and when we got this piece of paper in front of us, we go, this is what I'm entitled to. You see the energy as a resume goes out? Now, let's say we come and run everything through AA. And we come in here and we go, well, who are you? Oh, I'm Fred. I'm an alcoholic. That's it, Fred? Yeah, that's, that's about it. <laughs> and we know you better than if we read your resume. You told us everything we need to know. You see what I'm saying? You told us you're interested in helping others. You're not interested in yourself. You don't even care about telling us that you happen to own half of San Francisco. You go, no, no, that's not me. I'm Fred, an alcoholic. I'm Fred. You know what the freedom it is for Fred to just be an alcoholic and not be all the rest of that stuff? What a great freedom to just come in here and just be another guy, another gal. I'm just another gal here. I don't have to be all those other things. And Bill saw the great freedom in being anonymous. And so the next time we take a look at a resume and we go, what's on that resume? Oh, what's on this resume is a list of all of the attributes that God gave me that enables me to be useful to the place where I work. Here's a list of the things I can do for your company. That's what this list is. Wow. A lot of different energy going out of that resume. See, it's going the other way. It doesn't ask for anything coming back. It just wants to share service of God-given skills and trust that God will take care of us. And Bob ran his business that way, and his business was better than if he tried to make a lot of money. And your career will be better than if you try to advance yourself. That is trust in anonymity. Okay, we're at the end of the time. I don't know how we're going to wrap this up, but I'm going to sit down and thank you for your attention. I appreciate it. <laughs>